Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, fellow space travelers, history buffs, whatever you happen to be out there. Thank you so much for joining us. It's time for Sunday Night History Chat. My name is Michael C. Hardy. Welcome to my library uh, where we dive into deep parts of history and ideas and just see what we can come up with uh, chat wise. Um, I know some of y'all are interested in a certain event this evening, so I probably won't keep you too long, but we've got a few things that we're going to discuss here in a few minutes, and then I'm going to get up and try and find a piece of paper that I can't find. Something I copied at the archives like five years ago, and I need to find it, and I've already started looking, but that's okay. Uh, good evening, Adam and Jason and Josh and Robert and Wes. Hope everybody is doing really well. Uh, this evening, uh, if you want, drop a note in there. Tell us where you're watching from. Uh, love to see all those different um, folks. Uh, and um, just the way that this reaches out. When I first started writing, things like this, this type of interaction was really not possible. In fact, when I first started writing, if you took an online class, you got your class on old VHS tapes to watch that online. <clears throat> so... I think this is so much better. We can chat. Um, good evening, Corey and Ryan and Josh and Hardy Flanagan down in eastern North Carolina. Uh, and Isabella, who's sitting over there on the other side of the room. And Miss Elizabeth, who is sitting to my right. Even though she has her back to me, I must have done something wrong. Uh, but um, that's okay. Uh, hope everybody is doing well this evening. First, I, this evening, I want to confess. Uh, I have discovered that I gave y'all a bit of wrong information. Last Sunday night history chat, I told you that I was going to Valdez last night, which I did, and that tomorrow night I was going to Morganton, North Carolina, uh, to speak, and that was not true. I did go to Valdez last night, which we will talk more about here uh, in just a moment. But I am not going to Morganton until <clears throat> next Monday night, a week away. Uh, I will be speaking uh, at the uh, Burke County Public Library. It is their Genealogical Society quarterly meeting. And I will be talking somewhat about hidden history of Tower River Valley. But I'm going to be talking about the importance of local history as well. Uh, and I'm sure that this flyer, which the great folks down at the library created, generated, uh, and um, I am really looking forward to that uh, here in a week. Uh, so um, please come join me. If you live in Western North Carolina, uh, please come on out and Burke County Public Library, February 19th, 2024 at 6 p.m. And we'll have a great evening of talking history, just like we do tonight, but it'll probably be just a little bit more focused on um, something just a little bit different than uh, that event. Uh, there is Don up in Chesapeake, Virginia, and Riley, uh, and um, Gavin, who I saw last night. I uh, hope things are doing well. Uh, Neil says that he can't hear audio. I think everybody else can. Neil's, I'm not so sure what's going on with that. I am not a technological guru, at least not in the 21st century. Uh, so um, we'll go from there and see what we can find. Check it out. Check buttons. Check other things. I don't know. I don't know. So <clears throat> many of you know, I've <clears throat> mentioned this many times before, that when I travel or when I go to the Y, the gym, which of course I do from time to time, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of um, history podcasts, and I listen to um, science podcasts and history of science podcasts, all kinds of history. Uh, ben Franklin's World, um, Civil War Talk Radio, uh, Brian McClanagan, uh, Planetary Society. I just, just all kinds of things. Um, I think there's one called American History Tellers I listened to. Last night, I was listening on my way to speak. I spoke last night to the Sons of Confederate Veterans Camp down in Valdez, North Carolina. Great group. Uh, and last night, I was um, listening to a uh, podcast uh, called the American President's Podcast. 
And um, last night they were, um, he was interviewing uh, a man by the name of John Reeves, um, who wrote a book called The Lost Indictment of Robert E. Lee, which I've not read, but he was talking about his new book called Soldier of Destiny. Uh, slavery, secession, and the redemption of Ulysses S. Grant. That book actually came out December 2023. Um, I've not read the book yet. I don't own the book. Uh, but about 38 minutes, <coughs> excuse me, part of the book sounds really interesting, but I don't know. Um, you know, we only have so many days on this earth, and I already have seven or eight books over there on Grant. And so I don't know if I'll ever get around to that one. But parts of the book sound really interesting. Especially the whole slavery part. And um, Grant's role in that with his wife owning slaves and um, marrying into a very prominent slave-owning family there uh, around St. Louis and um, Grant buying a slave himself. Anyway, that's not part of our discussion this evening. About 38 minutes into the podcast. You can go to the American President podcast and check it out yourself. Listen to the whole thing. Uh, about 38 minutes into the podcast, the host asked Reeves about Grant's relationship with Lincoln. And Reeves, uh, the author of the book, states that Lincoln gave Grant the position of commander in chief, which is true. And in doing so, gave Grant a directive, and this is what Reeves said, uh, of, quote, just go win the war, keep me posted. Uh, he, meaning Grant, had a lot of freedom to fight, uh, and Lincoln did not want to get in the way. That's about the 38-minute mark. Um, the problem I see with this is um, Reeves' answer is incorrect in his assumption. Grant was not given free reign um, at all. And I actually, uh, back several months ago, um, let's see if I can find it. What have I done with it? Oh, right there. Uh, I actually, back um, several months ago, um, actually a year ago, no, several months ago, six months ago, uh, seven months ago, wrote a blog post uh, on looking for the Confederate war just on this very subject uh, called Grant's 1864 plan for North Carolina. Uh, and I see it seems and some of you may have read that um, it seems we have this idea uh, of what Grant was going to do and what his plan was in the spring of 1864. He was going to slip uh, through the wilderness uh, unobstructed and get between uh, Lee and Richmond and forced Lee to fight and et cetera, et cetera. And it didn't happen that way. Um, the wilderness was, was not good. Um, the Spotsylvania courthouse was not good. North Anna river was not good. Cold Harbor was horrible, uh, for Grant and his plans. And then after that, of course, Grant gets bogged down, uh, and Lee, uh, get bogged down into a siege around Petersburg and Richmond for Virginia. Um, but I discovered someplace in my research as I was reading along, I don't remember where that happened, um, that that was not Grant's plan at all. Grant in January of eight, nine, January 19th of 1864 actually presented a plan to his then boss, uh, general in chief, Henry Halleck. Uh, and of course, Grant eventually gets this post, but he doesn't have it at the time. And um, Grant's proposal was, as he wrote, this is a quote from Grant, I would suggest Raleigh, North Carolina as the objective point and Suffolk, Suffolk, Virginia, as the starting point. Raleigh once secured, I would make New Bern the base of supplies until Wilmington is secured. A moving force of 60,000 men would probably be required to start on such an expedition. This force would not have to be increased unless Lee should withdraw from his present position. In that case, the necessity for so large a force on the Potomac would not exist. Grant continues. These are his words. A force moving from Suffolk would destroy, first of all, the roads about uh, Weldon, meaning railroads, 
uh, or even as far north as Hicksford. Once there, the most interior line of railway still left to the enemy. In fact, the only one they would have would be so threatened as to force him to use a large portion of his army in guarding it. This would virtually force an evacuation of Virginia and indirectly is Tennessee. Not that we had a whole lot of troops in East Tennessee by this point in time. Uh, it would throw our armies into new fields where they could partially live upon the country and reduce the stores of the enemy. It would cause thousands of North Carolina troops to desert and return to their homes. It would give us possession of many Negroes who are not indirectly aiding the rebellion. It would draw the enemy from campaigns of their own choosing and for which they are prepared <clears throat> to new lines of operation never expected to become necessary. It would have effectively blockade Wilmington, the port now more valuable to the enemy than all the balance of their seacoast. It would enable operations to commence at once. Remember, he's writing in January, mid-January 1864. <clears throat> by removing the war to a more southern climate instead of months of inactivity in winter quarters. So, unlike what Reeves said that Lincoln gave Grant um, a, a free slate to go do what he said, that didn't happen at all. Halleck took a month, Henry Halleck took a month to reply to Grant. It's February 17th, 1864, and um, Halleck did not see the finer points of Grant's proposal. Uh, Lee's army, not Richmond, was to be Grant's objective, uh, although Grant never mentioned the Confederate capital. And, of course, we see this with McClellan two years earlier uh, when McClellan wants to do things, uh, and he's basically told, no, you can't go out there and do that. Um, Halleck goes on and says that, quote, there is evidently a general public misconception of the strength of our army in Virginia and about Washington. Uh, Meade's Army of the Potomac at the time, according to Halleck, numbered about 70,000 men uh, with about 18,000 soldiers and various garrisons around Washington, D.C. Um, Halleck goes on, suppose we were to send 30,000 men instead of the 60,000 that Grant wanted. Suppose we were to send 30,000 men from that army to North Carolina. Would not Lee be able to make another invasion of Maryland and Pennsylvania? Or would Grant's proposal force Lee to the aid of North Carolina? Halleck didn't believe so. He wrote, uncover Washington, the Potomac River, and all the forces which Lee can collect will be moved north, and the popular sentiment will compel the government to bring back the army in North Carolina to defend Washington, Baltimore, Harrisburg, and Philadelphia. Halleck did not believe that Lee would exchange Richmond for Raleigh and Wilmington. Halleck then reminded Grant that a large force had been sent against Charleston and for a year had achieved no important results. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with poor leadership. Uh, Halleck went on to mention other operations in Texas and Alabama. And he adds, quote, we have given too much attention to cutting the toenails of our enemy instead of grasping his throat. Then Halleck goes on to lay out the true, tried and true federal strategy in the East, quote, the overthrow of Lee's army being the object of operations here. Grant's plan was probably mentioned to Lincoln, but the plan of bypassing the Army of Northern Virginia and cutting the railroad in eastern North Carolina was null and void in the eyes of the Lincoln administration. Now, of course, we know that Grant replaced Halleck as general in chief of the armies on March 9th of 1864 and that Grant was named the commanding general, given the rank of lieutenant general as commanding general, he might could have revisited that idea of slipping into North Carolina, of cutting that railroad and cutting those supplies. Uh, and um, that would have put Lee in, in the Army of Northern Virginia and much of the population in Richmond, which probably is the largest city. It is the largest city in the Southern Confederacy at that time, um, in great jeopardy. Uh, especially if you are able to get uh, Hunter or Sheridan to raid down the Shenandoah Valley and burn it like they do later on. Um, something, absolutely something um, to think about. Um, 
Is it plausible? I mean, I guess, yes, anything is plausible. And what would Lee have done? You know, would he have, have called Longstreet uh, back to the Army of Northern Virginia um, early on? Um, given the food situation, the supply situation, um, the horse flesh situation, which we know is critical. Um, I don't know if Lee could have got back to, to Virginia or got back, went from Virginia to Maryland and Pennsylvania. I just don't think the army has the food stuff and the horse flesh. I know that, you know, regiments were, were being, cavalry regiments were being dispersed uh, to uh, go to various places and um, try and recuperate um, because they just don't have food. And, it, it, and it's really critical there, you know, in those first few months of 1864. Uh, so um, the, bod, the uh, podcast was really interesting. Um, they talk about, you know, had Grant been placed in the position um that McClellan was in, in late 1861, early 1862, that Grant probably would have failed miserably. Uh, that was Reeves take on that. Uh, and that it was better for Grant to have come up from the Colonel of a regiment, uh, to, you know, to be in that place by 1864. He had experience, uh, that McClellan lacked, uh, in, in late 61, early 62. Um, so I don't agree obviously, because that's what we're talking about this evening, uh, with everything that um, the podcast um, that, that Reeve said in the podcast, because uh, we've just spent quite a few minutes talking about that. Uh, but um, I do think there are some very interesting things about, you know, Grant's life. The book covers Grant from 1854 to 1864. Uh, and I don't know, maybe one day I will get the book and I will sit down and read it. Uh, and maybe I understand what it's like. I very much understand what it's like to speak on the fly, uh, which is what a lot of times we do this evening. And when people ask questions when I'm out speaking, um, maybe. Maybe Reeves doesn't know about that plan that Grant submitted in January of 1864 to go into North Carolina and the way that that plan was. Um, Grant was rebuffed with that plan. Uh, or maybe he just forgot. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I don't know. Or I don't know. So I see y'all making lots of comments. And of course, I'm not responding uh, to any of them. Um, Niels, it is really hard to watch anything on TV when you're driving up and down the road. And I, uh, you know, the law enforcement here in North Carolina, my section of North Carolina, really frown upon that. Uh, I don't really watch very much um, on TV anymore. Uh, but, Niels, let me encourage you to check out Ben Franklin's world. Um, they don't really, they, they seldom talk about Ben Franklin, but they talk a whole lot about colonial and revolutionary America. Uh, and occasionally the, um, the antebellum era as well. Um, so let me encourage you to check that out. I don't always agree with their folks, but it's most of it's pretty deep stuff um, about that time period. Um, so, Jason uh, Bushier, good to see you this evening. Um, Grant never had free reign. He was micromanaged at, uh, and, um, at the beginning and watched afterwards. Um, I think he had more free reign than um, McClellan, but then we we need to back up and say did did McClellan um, oh um, taint the waters? Um, is that the right expression, Elizabeth? Muddy the waters. Muddy the waters. Did McClellan muddy the waters um, because of his his plans and his constant cry for more men because he was vastly outnumbered? Um, maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, you know, and, and a lot of Grant's plan um, as as general in chief for early 1864 did not work at all. Um, you know, Grant was bogged down uh, there in the greater um, Chancellorsville, Spotsylvania area. Um, Butler, who was supposed to launch his attack um, coming up um, Bermuda, Bermuda 100 area. Um, 
that failed miserably. Um, Hunter in the Shenandoah Valley, that didn't go along so well. Uh, and where was the other attack? Was it Mobile, Alabama? Um, no, I don't remember where the other one is. I think it's Mobile, Alabama. I don't think all of Mobile fell until like April of 1865. Y'all can correct me on that. But or I didn't look that one up. Um, So, uh, Niels, what do you consider um, Early's uh, attack in the Shenandoah Valley uh, in mid-1864, where they actually get all the way to the outskirts of Washington, D.C.? Um, would you not consider that a, a major offensive operation? Um, just something to think about. I'm just reading your comments. Y'all continue to talk amongst yourself. Um, so, Niels, uh, Reeves last night actually did talk. Um, apparently, there's a chapter in this book. He does talk about um, Grant's drinking problem um, during the war. And um, was he the... Um, it's funny that Reeves bl blames uh, the, um, the lost cause folks in the post-war years as uh, the um, impetus behind um, Grant being a drunkard through most of the war. Uh, but you're right. Halleck actually perpetuated a lot of that during the war years. Um, and Grant did have a drinking problem. Uh, uh, but was he drunk during every battle he ever fought? No, probably not. Um, interesting. I don't know. Maybe one day I will get the book and read it. I have a lot to read right now, so I am blessed in that way. Um, so Jason mentions, uh, Jason, uh, Lloyd mentions, um, artillery horses, uh, and the horse flesh situation is pretty critical in, um, that, that part of 1864 in and around Virginia. Uh, so, um, Oh, Elizabeth says I need to explain we're not eating the horses. Horse flesh just means, horse flesh just means like animals to, pull yeah, animals to pull wagons and for the cavalry to ride to pull artillery pace, pieces and caissons and battery forges and, and uh, all of those things. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's a really critical point in time and it continues to be so uh, for the rest of 1864 and early 1865. Um, just, just, I don't think a lot of times we take that into account uh, so much of this logistic time period. Uh, if Grant launches this attack into eastern North Carolina and Lee does decide to go north. So, you know, Grant's proposing, let's say March, say it takes two months to get this ready and to get the soldiers loaded onto boats and to get them through the Albemarle Sound and deposited at New Bern or Suffolk or New Bern, or Plymouth, or uh, Little Washington, or someplace there along the, the, the eastern part of North Carolina and move inland, you know, A, Grant has cut that railroad running out of Wilmington. B, there's nothing growing in the Shenandoah Valley in March of 1864. Uh, and uh, Lee's going to have a hard time with fodder and food for his men to mount that offensive up through the Shenandoah Valley and into Maryland and Pennsylvania, where there's still not anything growing. Uh, so I think that part of the logistics needs to be kept in mind uh, before we say, oh, wow, you know, uh, how do they put it in the movie Gettysburg? Um, it's going to double back and land a flip or something. I've forgotten since it's been so long since I watched that movie. Um, but, uh, and come in on this rear or something like that. Um, maybe that's not in Gettysburg. I don't think so. I maybe it's in gods and generals. I don't remember now. Um, I don't remember at all. Um,
But Adam says Mobile fell in August of 1864. I must be thinking of something else. I'll have to go back and look. Um, so, yes, Grant did get his experience. Um, in the uh, Western theater. Uh, and, you know, it's the Western theater is a totally different war than the Eastern theater. Uh, the Eastern theater, as we've talked about before, is very. Cons oh, what's a good word? Well, I'm having problems with good words tonight. Very compact theater of operations, you know, between Petersburg and Richmond and the Shenandoah Valley and Gordonsville and Winchester uh, Fredericksburg, uh, it's really tight. And when we get to the Western theater, it is vast. Uh, and, and I think that is, you know, two different, two very different thoughts of the war. And there's always the discussion, you know, if Lee, what would have happened if Lee would have went West, uh, instead of sending Longstreet in September of 1863 in the battle of Chickamauga Chattanooga time period. And at the same time, you know, what would have happened if Forrest would have come East? It's a different war. It's an entirely different war. Um, so, um, I don't think a lot of times we keep that in mind. Uh, plus Lee was extremely familiar with that Virginia topography, the same way that Forrest was much more familiar with the area in and around Memphis and North Alabama and North Mississippi, uh, Western Tennessee. Uh, so um, that that's, I think sometimes we want to armchair general. We always want the armchair general, but we don't think of all of those contingencies uh, that go along with that uh, at the same time. Um, Reading comments, reading comments. Uh, so, David, Pope, what way can we feed troops that doesn't involve the Confederate supply system in March of 1864? You know, we've got to go to people's houses and we have got to take their food, which Confederates did during the Gettysburg campaign, allowed the Confederate army to survive for months. Uh, but, you know, um, but that months that it that foodstuffs that were captured, um, that that was running out by late December of sixty three, early sixty four. So um, you, you have to think of the condition of the men uh, and how little they are eating at that point in time. Jason says the quote came from Grant or one of Grant's aides talking about what Marsh Warbit was going to do at the Battle of the Wilderness in the Ken Burn series. Been a long time since I watched that too. Um, I'm so glad Gareth didn't place that ring in God's general. Sorry. I was trying so hard. I don't know what it is. David, where is the closest Union force of that size? big enough to support a advance into Pennsylvania all the way up to Harrisburg. Uh, I don't think the garrison at Winchester or Harper's Ferry. Um, I can't even remember if Winchester is under control. Who's under, whose control is Winchester under in the winter of 63, 64? Um, and even, I think even getting there um, is, is, is a challenge. It really is logistically speaking. Um, Jason, I don't really remember. Um, I have to go back, Jason, and look at um, what Van Dorn is doing in the, you know, I read a book about the Tullahullah campaign like last year, and I've obviously put that into one section of my brain that I'm not using at this current time because 
I am elsewhere right now. Um, but that's kind of what's going on around here. Gosh, there's still 15 of you hanging out with me after 30 minutes uh, here on February 11th, 2024. Um, that is just awesome. Uh, I hope you enjoyed last week uh, having Skip Smith on. I've got some other folks coming up uh, in the near future uh, that I will love to get on the channel here. Uh, we're on uh, YouTube as well right now. You can look me up, Hardy on History. I think Elizabeth posted the link last week, and she may post one here. And I have nine followers. Oh, my gosh. Uh, we're going to do a lot more with that. I hadn't really decided which direction I want to take it, but... Uh, I'm kind of leaning toward just staying in here in North Carolina for a while and and just letting it grow and see what happens uh, as we go along um, and just continue to tell history and share history and um, Adam says he thinks the Federals held Winchester 6364. Um, Yes, Jeffrey Hunt wrote a fantastic post-Gettysburg uh, multi-volume campaign study. Um, I had a chance of signing books with him ooh, back in 2019 at Gettysburg. Uh, we were together there uh, in the National Park Service um, Visitor Center signing books. And um, I think there are three volumes to that study. Uh, just really good Um Really good books. Um, glad somebody took that on and um, dug into that part of the war and the conflict. Um, so that's kind of what's going on here this evening. We got a lot of exciting things we're going to do here in the near future. I've got a bunch of research trips to take uh, in the near future. And um, we'll just go from there and see what we can do. Uh, hope everybody's out there reading a lot this winter and digging. I've got a half a dozen things I'm reading at one time. I am currently reading a, um, a book uh, by Drew A. Swanson called A Man of Bad Reputation. Uh, it's about the murder of Chicken Stevens uh, here in North Carolina in the Reconstruction time period. I'm about halfway through it. Um, it's got problems. Um, and I'll, I'll address, I'm actually reading this for review um, for emerging civil war. And twice in there, he refers to Governor Worth, Jonathan Worth, who is governor um, in, in the late 1860s. And he refers to Worth as serving more than one term as governor which he did. Yeah. Wes said, bless you, Elizabeth. Um, she's sitting over there by the firebox, even though I don't have a fire in it this evening. I could, I almost did, but I didn't, um, didn't do it. We spent the afternoon out after church. So, um, David Pope is, um, thinking about going to Monocacy in Waynesboro. Uh, Corey's trying to get me to come to Robeson County, maybe in August. Um, problem with that is I work almost every Friday and Saturday night, so I haven't got that figured out yet. Um, but I'll have to keep looking at that and see. Uh, if you're sending me email, I am slowly getting to them or messages on Facebook. I'm slowly getting to them uh, slowly. Um, I'm just, my aviation project is taking an enormous amount of time, research time and uh, digging and rooting. It's a lot of fun. I slightly rewrote a piece of North Carolina history the other day, or I will be when it comes out. Uh, but um We'll have to get there um, in the near future. Um, so much to do, so much research to do here over the next few weeks. Uh, so uh, if you got any more questions or comments, please drop them in the box and I will work hard on getting to them. Uh, and um, we will um, take a stab at them. Uh, if you were with me last night, um, we actually talked about this Um Back during the Sussex Quintennial, I was going around doing Civil War roundtables 
like hosting Civil War roundtables. And we would go to a local museum or a county library and um, we would advertise it and we would invite folks to come in. And I would just do a short, very short introduction. And I would sit down and people could ask questions. And I did those in several North Carolina counties. The biggest one I ever did was at the Burke County Museum of History. Uh, or the History Museum of Burke County, whichever one. Uh, we had slightly over 100 people, and it went on for three hours. Uh, so I almost needed help back up the mountain um, after that three-hour conversation. But it's kind of like what we do here on Sunday night um, history chat. Um, you know, um, we just talk and ask questions and share. And some of y'all will ask stuff, and I don't remember. And and some of y'all will have the answers, or you're faster at Google. Um, and, um, go from there. Um, so, um, Jason wants to know, do I subscribe to a podcast group or where do you go to get all those mentioned? I just have several, um, that I, I don't remember what I use. Um, no, I do not subscribe to thing. I just have an app on my phone, uh, that's Google podcast. And I just go through and I search. Uh, and so I will listen to the American president. I will listen to American history tellers this week in space, Ben Franklin's world. Uh, there's one on the American revolution, uh, Brian McClanagan's um, page. I will listen to uh, planetary radio. I will listen to um, there's a brand new Antietam. There's also a Gettysburg um I, I haven't listened to those yet, but maybe we'll get there in the near future. Um, and um, I just listen to stuff. And like I said, I don't always agree with what I listen to. I didn't agree with everything that Reeves was saying on the one I listened to last night. Uh, but um, it's great to learn and, and explore new things and come up with new ideas. Uh, and um, that's, that's, it's just awesome. Um, great way to spend time, uh, for me as I travel about, you know, exploring different areas of history, uh, things that I might not have ever even thought of. And believe it or not, there's a lot of history I've never really thought of. Uh, and that's just what I listen to. Uh, Jason says that he will be at the Landon Carter Haynes monument dedication, which is March 30th. I'm still trying to get that worked out because I'm supposed to work the 29th, um, and then we have a lot of stuff to do on the 31st. Uh, so I'm trying to get out of the night of the 29th and drive over and turn around and drive back or something like that. The only challenge to that is the weekend before uh, that Saturday, I will be speaking at Pamphlin Park just below Petersburg, Virginia uh, at their breakthrough weekend event. And so to go from Petersburg to almost Memphis, um, that's a nice little haul. Uh, so we're trying to get that worked out. Any other thoughts or questions? Um, so Jason, I don't have a specific group that I, I listen to, but I, I can send you a couple of links. Um, some of it, the Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin's world is pretty thick stuff. Uh, and I greatly enjoy it. Uh, the American revolution podcast is more fun, even though he's going through the American revolution, um, chronologically, more or less chronologically. Uh, so, um, just, just good stuff. Um, Corey wants to know what is the best civil war podcast? I don't know if there is a best one right now. Um, uh, civil war talk radio has got a professor from ECU, uh, Jerry Prokovovich. Sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, and I've actually been interviewed on there once, but he almost every week during the school year uh, talks to an author of some book um, related to that time period. Uh, so um, that that one's really good. Usually I don't always agree with everything I listen to, um, but it's, it's got to have some discernment there. Um, and there's a new con podcast being done by the Confederate shop. Uh, but I've not listened to that yet either. Uh, so, um, plus there's one on, like I said, Antietam and one on Gettysburg. Uh, so check those out in the near future. Wes wants to know what day I will be at Pamphlin. What day will I be at Pamphlin Park? I will be there speaking on March 23rd, Saturday, March 23rd, 
of 2024. Um, March 23rd. I have no idea what time yet. I've not seen that. Uh, so um, that is the plan. Um, yep. You can also check out online um, Friday Night Live um, with Friends of Douglas South Hall Freeman Group that David Pope does. Um, I don't make a lot of his. I'll try and watch some of them later but because uh, I work most Friday and Saturday nights. Um, but please check those out. And of course, there are all kinds of great um, vlogs out there on YouTube. Uh, History Underground, The History Guy, uh, or two, um, Mark Felton Productions. There's a un something history of World War II in the Pacific, um, unauthorized history of World War II in the Pacific. Um, all kinds of stuff out there. Um, dark Matters. Um, what else? Oh, I don't remember that name of that one. Uh, so that's what's going on. Wes, I don't have a time yet, what time I'll be speaking, but I will drop it on my Facebook page when I get there. Uh, so with that, if I don't see any other questions, I'll wait here just a minute, but I'm going to sign off and I'm going to try and find that paper that I need that I copied at the State Archives in Raleigh back in 2019 because uh, I need that. And it should be in one of these notebooks around here. And I've got to go find it. I look before we went live. I'll look after. Uh, and we will just go from there. All right, folks. I think it's going to do it for me this evening. Uh, I will say that the entire Hardy family sitting in this room. Isabella sitting over there at her computer. Elizabeth sitting over here with her iPad grading papers. Um, I was going to say that I am going to sign off for tonight. Thank y'all so much for joining me here on Sunday night history chat. Um, please come and check me out again and invite your friends and we will go from there and see what kind of history we can dig into. What kind of trouble, uh, that we can cause. I'm sure that I cause trouble from time to time. Y'all have a great week. Um, continue to keep digging in the history, sharing history. Uh, that's that's what makes a difference uh, out there. Have a great evening. God bless.